want to um, very enthusiastically introduce our, our keynote speaker, John Restakis. John has, um, is the executive director of the British Columbia Association of Cooperatives. He uh, teaches classes in Bologna. Uh, he uh, is very, very active in the cooperative movement and recently wrote a book called Humanizing the Economy in an Age of Capital. That book uh, will be available if you'd like to purchase the book. You can um, purchase it at our, uh, the registration desk from someone there. Um, you can also get it from, um, from John at lunch. Um, so the book is, um, he's selling the book for $20, pretty reasonable amount of money. So anyway, I, I recently had uh, the book used at a book club that I am uh, a member of, and it was a big hit. So I highly recommend the book. Uh, and so without further ado, I'd really like to introduce uh, John. Thank you, Kim. Uh, hello, everybody. <laughs> um, we'll see how all this works. I, um, I'm going to shift this around just a little bit so I can sort of see what I'm doing. And um, this morning, uh, I had a nice sort of night's sleep. And I woke up this morning, and I looked for my glasses, and they just disappeared overnight. I don't know where they've gone. I put them on the uh, bed stand right next to my bed, and they're just like, so, um, uh, you, if, uh, I'm going to have to sort of be referring to this a fair bit and sort of straining it a little bit to read it, but it's good large font so I can actually see it. Um, so it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I want to thank uh, Kim and all her colleagues for inviting me to come down. Um, and uh, I have to say that these kinds of gatherings uh, and people inviting me to come down and speak to them are increasing in number all the time. Uh, there's obviously a lot of interest and a lot of energy that is uh, sort of accumulating and accelerating uh, in these days. Uh, people thinking about and wondering about how to respond to uh, a broken system. Uh, and co-ops are beginning now to come back into focus as a possible uh, remedy to what is ailing uh, not just our economy, uh, but our social uh, connections and our social systems. And I hope to touch on some of this stuff over the course of the next half hour or so. Um, the, um, the subject of the, of the presentation is co-ops in the age of capital, which is like a huge subject, um, and it kind of encompasses uh, basically what I was writing about in, in the book. Um, but I'm going to try and illustrate this theme by basically uh, sharing with you some stories um, drawn from a variety of co-ops. Uh, that I have uh, visited over the last, uh, you know, seven or eight years, each of which tells a very different kind of story, and each of which, in a sense, illustrates the um, variety of uses to which cooperatives are being put, and the contexts in which they're being used. Very, very different from one place to another, and as you will see, the kinds of uses to which they are being put um, are responding to very individual kinds of uh, situations and responding to very different needs that people have. And um, in a sense, giving um, a very multi-dimensional perspective on what the role of co-ops uh, is today in the middle of this age of capital. So let me just begin, uh, if this is actually going to work. You see? You're going to do it for me? OK, all right. We'll do it the old-fashioned way. So if you could just, all right. So there are four themes that, as I was thinking about these stories, that kind of emerge. Um, resilience, um, how people are using co-ops in very different ways to adapt to very difficult circumstances, and the incredible resilience of the model itself. Now, resistance, 
uh, how co-ops still are a main instrument of resistance to um, inequities in terms of economic inequities, social inequities, power inequities, and um, a response to the accumulating concentration of wealth and power uh, in an ever-diminishing number of hands, internationally and nationally. Um, repair, how co-ops are actually being used to repair the damage that has been inflicted on communities, both internationally as a result of globalization and closer to home as a result of the kind of practices and attitudes that are becoming uh, detrimental to the well-being and health of societies and communities within those societies. And then uh, revision. What uh, are these stories telling us and what is the co-op model offering us in terms of rethinking what the future might look like in an economic system that actually responds to personal and human and social needs as opposed to simply uh, the demands of uh, capital and a corporate uh, system that by all accounts is beyond uh, the control of governments, uh, of societies, of people. How do we respond to this and how do we revision an economic system that actually responds to the real needs of real people and real communities? So I start with an example drawn from Sri Lanka um, and the uh, trying to connect the use of cooperatives within the context, the largest context of sort of globalization. And I visited uh, uh, Sri Lanka and uh, the tea plantations uh, a few years ago. Uh, I was on a, an assignment uh, to examine the impact of a program that had been developed by the Canadian Cooperative Association in partnership with the Canadian Red Cross to provide life skills and training to all those hundreds of thousands of people that had been displaced and uprooted by the tsunami you know, that hit uh, Asia uh, in 2005. And in the course of my work there, I started looking at uh, the uh, tea co-ops in Sri Lanka. And I started finding out about uh, the fair trade system and just how extensive, uh, how um, successful uh, not only a, a fair trade is as a global phenomenon, as a response to globalization, but also how absolutely central and crucial the co-op model is to fair trade. Um, the, uh, the tea industry, of course, is huge in the world. And, and like all sort of commodity uh, uh, trade, like coffee or bananas, uh, tea is controlled um, by a very small number of global firms, uh, especially firms that uh, purchase and package and sell this tea. And of course, the returns to the workers um, who are actually picking the plants and producing the, uh, the, uh, the tea uh, is uh, barely survival uh, wages. Their work conditions uh, are hazardous, to say the least. Uh, a study was done to show that the chemical agents uh, in pesticides that are used to, um, you know, to work with the plantation uh, tea uh, plants uh, have found themselves into the bloodstreams of these workers. Uh, in males, it's affecting uh, the, the health of their sperm and therefore abnormalities in births and so on. And so um, the, the tea workers, uh, the pickers uh, in plantations, of course, are contract workers uh, and working very hazardous conditions, very low pay. And I started looking at uh, an organization by uh, the name of ASOFA, um, the Small Organic Farmers Association. And it's an organization that is uh, organizing uh, these small producers, small farmers, to help them cultivate tea in an organic uh, methodology. So it's providing them with training, it's providing them with materials, it's providing them with connections to allow them to aggregate the tea from the very small uh, land holdings into a global 
uh, uh, marketing system that is controlled by fair trade principles and fair trade networks. This is a, um, a gathering of uh, villagers in this one community um, where they are holding an assembly. And part of what is involved in this process, of course, is a democratic uh, involvement of uh, pickers uh, and their families and their communities around negotiating uh, what is an acceptable price and the other operations with uh, the Small Organic Farmers Association which is taking these uh, products and then marketing for these growers uh, overseas. Uh, the Small Organic Farmers Association is also distributing plants, tea plants, to growers. But not just tea plants, uh, they are distributing uh, livestock. of these farmers, and increasingly they're becoming conversant in the practices of organic agriculture and how to restore to health the land that over the years had been so depleted by monoculture, right, by single plant uh, practices uh, and the pesticides and so on. The other aspect, of course, of the work of a fair trade organization, this is just one example, is the kind of uses uh, to which they put uh, the um, profits, the surpluses that come back to the communities as a result of the fair trade agreements. So in this case, for example, they uh, build and provide fresh water supply to communities that had to either go long distances to get access to clean water uh, or um, had to deal with water that was uh, unhealthy, a source of you know, disease and, and sickness and so on. So everything from the training uh, and then the utilization of organic farming practices and the aggregation of products for sale into international trade net uh, networks managed by a fair trade, international fair trade system is being promoted by this model. But while people do know about fair trade and how important it's become to a lot of communities, hundreds and hundreds of communities internationally, a lot of people really don't understand to what extent fair trade is actually based on a co-op model. So people understand fair trade. They don't understand that the whole reason that it succeeds, that it works, is because the small producers, the small growers at the community level are actually organized to have democratic control over how the system works. Fair trade would not exist today were it not for small producer co-ops at the very foundation of the system. And it is one of the outstanding international success stories of how cooperatives are being used by communities to respond to the exploitation and inequities and injustices of a global trade system managed and controlled by international trade monopolies. And this is just some figures around this. There are almost, probably more than this now, 746 producer organizations in almost 60 developing countries that are actually handling and managing the fair trade system internationally. These are figures from 2008, but just in one year, from 2008 to 2009, the increase in fair trade sales jumped over 20% in one year. So at that point, it was $5.5 billion in trade that had been done by fair trade. That was four years ago. This figure could be double now, because what is also happening is with the growth of fair trade marketing and systems and uh, uh, success and efficiency, there's a growing awareness in developing nations, in places like California and Vancouver and Canada and so on, in Europe primarily, where consumers are beginning to understand the connection between how they spend their dollars, 
and what it means to people that they're actually purchasing their tea and their coffee and their bananas and their pineapples and so on. So what fair trade is doing is relinking the buyer with the producer. What was once uh, a task uh, and uh, um, an aspiration of the early co-ops in the 1800s in Britain that were trying to connect consumers with uh, farmers in a local you know, uh, uh, fair trade system has now been expanded and been globalized by fair trade. Right? So this connection between buyer and seller, uh, the wealthy with the poor, is a major accomplishment and has uh, done enormous work to change the outlook and attitudes, expectations, and values of conscious consumers in the developing world, which uh, directly benefit producers in the poor world. Now, there are over 6,000 items that are in the fair trade system, right? So the fair trade example is just one instance of how cooperatives are being used internationally to address these kind of power and economic imbalances. And it is a, a, a very good example of how communities are using uh, the co-op model to be very resilient uh, in terms of how they respond and move beyond simply organizing single item, single commodities for international trade, but now beginning to think about how do we diversify our regional economies? How do we use the surplus from our fair trade networks to actually build factories, value-added uh, processes, to organize networks of producers and buyers and suppliers regionally so that we can build our regional economies locally and not just rely on international trade systems on the commodities that we grow for the first world. So that was just kind of one example of uh, co-ops and their relevance uh, to capital on a kind of a global scale. I'm going to talk about Japan uh, because most people, I think, don't uh, really think about Japan as this kind of a center for cooperation. But in fact, Japan is one of the world's real leaders, especially in the field of consumer co-ops and in, in the uh, production uh, of health care for uh, citizens. These are just some of the figures uh, relating to the co-op movement in Japan. Consumer co-ops are uh, the most powerful and the largest of uh, Japan's uh, co-ops. Um, about 24 million people are members of consumer co-ops in Japan. Um, and connected to the consumer co-ops are the health co-ops. And I'll spend a bit of time on that in a minute. But insurance, there are 57 insurance co-ops, uh, co some 14 million members belong to those. Over 800 agricultural co-ops. Fishing. Japan has one of the largest, if not the largest, um, uh, fishing uh, industry in the world. The entire uh, fishing industry in Japan is basically organized around cooperatives that manage the licenses and the practices and the sale, the marketing and so on of uh, fish products for uh, the Japanese fishing industry, forestry, worker co-ops and so on. So one in five Japanese belong to a local consumer co-op. And this is interesting, that last figure. 90% of uh, co-op members in Japan are women. They are the driving force behind the co-op movement in Japan, and in particular, the consumer co-ops and the healthcare co-ops. So um, one of the things uh, that really drove the rise of consumer co-ops, especially some of the most um, activist consumer co-ops, like Seikatsu Club in Japan, was the concern among uh, especially Japanese uh, uh, women that the food they were uh, accessing was unhealthy. That it had been contaminated by pesticides, uh, they were concerned about GMOs, they were concerned about the ways in which uh, chemical and uh, really unhealthy uh, uh, farm practices were infecting milk and rice and so on. 
And so they started organizing uh, their own relationships between farmers and families in the cities that were accessing food directly from uh, their, um, uh, their partners uh, in the agricultural economy surrounding these cities. And they were started to organize what are called Han, H-A-N, which are basically households, usually 10 to 20 in number, that work together as food buying clubs to contract you know, with local farmers for rice and milk and so on. Thank you, I was gonna mention that. So, um, one of the issues then became, how do we guarantee the health uh, and the safety of the food that we eat? And so there was a very deep connection in the consumer co-op movement in Japan between um, fair economic practices and very intimate concerns around health issues and around the ways food connects to um, uh, community, to the social bonds between people, and how then to develop a consumer co-op that not only provided members with access to safe food, but also cultivated the social connections between people in community that you know, are built up around food. So there's a very um, powerful social dimension uh, and a health dimension to the consumer co-op movement in Japan, uh, which we do not find in North America, certainly we don't find it in Canada. So local farmers uh, contracting directly with food buying clubs in the cities to provide them with steady supply of safe food. Now, the other thing that happened was the linking of the consumer co-ops with the provision of essential health care uh, to, uh, to uh, Japanese communities. And the health system in Japan, uh, I mean, there's a private system, there's a government-provided system, and the health co-ops that are in Japan today, there's over 120 hospitals now operating across Japan that provide health services to uh, to the Japanese uh, citizens. So this is just one example. Um, they uh, originated in 1988, this, that picture of the Nagano Health Co-op to provide nursing care, um, but it's long-term care, it's elder care, it's primary care, it's um, health um, uh, promotion, education, and so one of the major preoccupations of the health co-ops in Japan is not just doing a sort of um, uh, direct health care for people that are already sick, but even more importantly, promoting healthy lifestyles. This is just an example of one of the clinics uh, that, uh, that I visited. And what is really interesting about the health model that they're using is the involvement of community members directly in a whole range of activities that today are professionalized in, uh, in North America. So for example, um, this is a group of members of a local Han. Um, most of these individuals will also belong to the local consumer co-op and food buying club. But in this case, what they're doing is they're uh, getting instruction on doing um, urine analysis so that they can identify people in the community that are developing health problems. And then what they do is they take this data, they work with a nurse practitioner, and they feed it back into the local health co-op, the hospital or the health clinic, so that the, you know, the doctors and the managers of the health co-ops can forecast and react to in a preventative way, the emerging health problems that are taking place in that community. So health promotion, health education, and a kind of a, an advanced warning system is a key part of what these Han do. And in addition to this, they raise money. They do fundraising. So they extend the, uh, the services and the um, facilities that are available to the local health co-op uh, and they do it independently and in, uh, of you know, requiring government support for doing it. 
and they have regular sort of uh, public um, uh, exercise and nutrition and health promotion activities. Uh, this is just one example where they're doing these kind of uh, health exercises right outside uh, this uh, particular compound, which is uh, one of the headquarters of the local Han associated with the local health co-op. Right? So two of the things that they identify as being central to the mission of the health co-ops is creating social relationships and strengthening the community as the most important priority of the co-op. It's not just health care. It's about maintaining the health of the community relationships that really are the underpinning and the foundation for healthy communities. And health care, quality health care, is a key component of this community building work that they do. Okay, so here's an example of the co-op model being used in a very uh, industrialized society. Uh, and it's not just about uh, you know, access to markets and so on, it's about dealing with the kinds of social and health issues that uh, advanced post-industrial societies are having to deal with. And it is, um, I, I picked this example because I think it has a particular resonance to Americans and to Canadians increasingly around the question of how do we actually you know, deal with health care uh, in an environment where health, social care, elder care, and so on is increasingly viewed as simply a commodity commodifying social care, uh, commercializing it, placing it in the hands of for-profit organizations who don't see health care as an end, or health as an end in itself, the promotion of health, or the promotion of, um, uh, certainly not the promotion of community bonds and social relations, but rather see health as a means to an end that instrumentalizes people to generate profits. How do you respond to a situation like that? And this is just one example uh, of how, in the Japanese instance, co-ops are being used as a mechanism to reconnect people's health with community health. And the bottom of this, the foundation of this, is the democratic control and the democratic involvement of individuals in those communities through their health co-ops to recontextualize health as for what it is. It's a social question, it's a community question, and it has to do about how people relate to each other and how they build the social bonds that advance community health uh, and not just health as an individual pursuit. The last two examples, uh, where am I at right now? How much time do I have? <laughs> I got five minutes? You see, I, I'm glad I asked. Um, everybody's reading about and quite concerned about uh, the meltdown that's going on in Europe, uh, you know, the debt crisis, the austerity measures that are going on, and so on. This is really a replay of what happened in Argentina in the late 1990s early 2000. Argentina went into bankruptcy in 2001. Uh, thousands of factories were shuttered after owners basically uh, bankrupted these factories, um, had been taking for years public money, uh, tax breaks to operate these factories uh, in a way that was really fine for them in terms of their own you know, personal profit, but really left nothing behind but debt to government and unemployment and shutter factories to the communities that had been supplying the workers. What did the workers do? They didn't roll over. They didn't just demonstrate. They started reoccupying these factories and putting them back to work, claiming that since the factories had for so many years been receiving public funds, since the bankruptcies had been built on public debt, that something was owed to the public and something was owed to those communities. They were reclaiming these factories so that those communities could actually reconnect you know, their workers to 
uh, to a livelihood that would allow them to, uh, to go on. I mean, this was a really desperate situation. Um, and so, Brookman um, the Garment Factory was among the first of the factories that were uh, recovered in, in Argentina. Um, this is Xenon, which produced tiles. Uh, this is a workers' assembly uh, that, that regularly takes place. These are all basically worker co-ops where they're employed uh, by the co-op uh, as workers. Um, there are about 300 of these factories that have been established uh, since about uh, 2003, 2004, with no capital, very little in the way, nothing in the way of political support. And over that time, these are factories that have gone bankrupt, remember? Over that time, a total of two of these factories have since closed. Two, nearly 300, all 300 of them are still in operation and they're growing. And so they stand, I think, and it's not just factories, it's hotels, it's hospitals, it's um, uh, schools, right? So right across uh, the, the spectrum, uh, the recovery movement started recovering and reorganizing and reinvigorating both public and private institutions that had been uh, bankrupted and neglected both by the public sector and by the private sector. This is, these are folks from the Hotel Bowen. And one of the things that was a real lesson for the workers that became involved in these co-ops, most of them for the first time, most of them had had no previous experience with co-ops. They were basically backed into the co-ops by a crisis situation. Most of these workers had been raised within a, within a very um, powerful authoritarian environment. They were used to following orders, used to being deferential to bosses, used to having a government which was sort of oscillating between you know, military junta to authoritarian sort of uh, civilian government over the last 30 years. And so their exposure and their involvement in co-ops was really their first taste of what democracy really feels like. Their ability to think about, reflect, agree on how they should operate as workers in their interest and in the interest of their communities was their first exposure to democracy actually in practice. It was a profound attitude shift that took place among these individuals. So the impact of the recovered factory movement was not just to put into play again the uh, broken factories that had been shuttered by the previous owners. It was to catalyze in the workers an entirely new understanding of what it meant to be a worker, what it meant to be a citizen, and what the intimate connection is between factories and community. Because none of this would have worked had they not been able to organize widespread community support to protect these factories from uh, the soldiers and the former owners that now wanted to take them back and, and keep them out. Am I finished? I'm going to end with one final story. Um, of all the co-ops that I have visited, uh, this has probably been uh, the most powerful and the most inspiring for me personally. Uh, this here is Sonuka. Uh, she is uh, in her early 40s. She's a sex worker in Calcutta. Uh, she uh, was uh, sold into the sex trade in Sonagachi, which is a community I'm going to be talking about, at the age of about 14. And she has been working as a sex worker since that time. And there are about, in this community of Sonagachi, there are about uh, 4,000 sex workers. And they are uh, basically held in, um, uh, in their trade by about 20,000 men, migrant workers, uh, most of them, that come and visit Sonagachi uh, on a regular basis. Um, there are about 370 brothels 
that operate in Sonagachi, most of them have anywhere from um, uh, five to six to seven, uh, you know, um, uh, sex workers um, in uh, in the brothels, and or rather the buildings uh, that are about uh, these buildings contain five to six brothels within them. Okay, and this is an average sort of a typical room. Uh, where these, not just these individual women live, but their families, sometimes multi-generational uh, families, uh, sometimes up to 10 or 12 people living in a single room. And one of the victims, of course, the primary victims of uh, uh, the system, in addition to the exploitation of the, of the women, is the discrimination against their children. So children uh, typically had been barred from going to school because they were associated with a, a mother that was in the sex trade. So they grew up illiterate, without skills, and so on, and just perpetuated this cycle of poverty uh, that existed uh, in the trade. Well, what happened was, in 1992, the World Health Organization had contacted um, one of the doctors in the area to do a survey on the incidence of HIV AIDS uh, and sexually transmitted diseases uh, among uh, the sex workers in four cities, Calcutta being one of them, Mumbai, Madras uh, being uh, a couple of the others. What emerged out of this was a very powerful uh, movement uh, among the sex workers that started to ask themselves, what is our problem? What's the issue that's actually at play here? Because what they discovered very quickly was that the women really didn't care so much about whether they had AIDS. The reason is because they really didn't hold their lives in very high esteem. They had such low self-esteem, they didn't care enough about saving themselves. So very quickly it was understood that the underlying issue of AIDS and uh, life and death had to do with the power relationships in a system of exploitation that so maltreated these women and their families that they didn't have the motivation, actually, to visit the health clinic, do the tests, and so on. So what ended up happening is the women started organizing a co-op to address these power relationships in the community. When you were asked, what do we want to use this co-op for? The first thing they said was, we want access to credit. We want to be able to get out from under the thumb of the local loan sharks that prevent us from saving money, which means we can't send our kids to school. We can't marry our daughters because we, have, we can't afford dowries. We can't own property, and therefore we're constantly beholding to you know, the brothel owners. In other words, lack of access to credit meant they were perpetually in beholden to the local politicians and the police and the pimps and the brothel owners and so on. They organized Usha Multipurpose Co-op, which provided sex workers for the first time access to credit because they, they weren't allowed to open bank accounts. Immediately what started happening is their lives changed. They started using the co-op to provide health care. They now operate eight health clinics in Calcutta. Uh, the incidence of HIV AIDS in Calcutta is the lowest among sex workers in all of India. And today, the Usha Multipurpose Co-op has expanded, so it's not just Calcutta, it's the whole state of West Bengal. And they have 60,000 members that belong to the co-op. And it's not just credit, they operate schools for their kids, they do political work, lobbying for uh, schools to accept kids from the sex trade. They operate uh, training sessions. This is a little sort of uh, operation that they have. These women, they're all sex workers. These women are hand making uh, sanitary napkins that they then sell to hospitals and to other women in the, in the, in the community. They have dozens of these kinds of operations going on. And so, what's happening uh, in Calcutta is an example of, I would say, 
what's for me one of the most interesting uses of co-ops. It's not just about global trade. It's not just about economic uh, exploitation, which is one example of. It's also about how women, for the first time in this case, have been using the co-ops to come out of the shadows to find a voice for themselves and to redress the gender inequities that are so rife in this community and in India generally. So the co-op has given them a vehicle, a mechanism, not only to lift up their own lives, not only to give them a political voice, but to empower them uh, in a context where they were at the very bottom of the social ladder. Right? So it's a very personal and a very intimate use of co-ops as personally empowering organizations that go to the very heart of what it means to have self-worth and to have a voice and to have a role in a society where previously uh, they were invisible. Okay? So I leave you with that story because it's an example of the extent to which the co-op model is helping transform lives. In the developing world, the imbalances, the inequities, um, the challenges that co-ops are dealing with are really a replication of the very same conditions that were operating in the, in the 1800s in the UK when co-ops first began as a response to the factory system, the social and economic injustices associated with the factory system. All of these principles and dynamics are replaying themselves through globalization. The very same conditions that gave rise to co-ops in the 1800s in England are now being fostering new co-ops like the fair trade systems as a result of globalization abroad. And then the question I think for us is, how do we look at this model and then reinterpret it and use it so that we can reimagine what economic democracy, social justice, and the inequities and inequalities built into our economic system can be redressed by once again connecting social values to our economic system. I think economic democracy and co-ops are at the foundation of that, and maybe we can talk about how that actually gets played out in the context of a post-industrial society like the United States and Canada. I'll leave it there. Thank you.